Good morning, everyone. <laughs> OK, I know we're all a bit jet lagged, myself included, but we work in energy, so I thought maybe we'd have a bit more energy this time. Good morning. Good morning. Wonderful. My name is Scott Andrews, and I'm a communications officer with the Climate Investment Funds, and I am delighted to welcome you to London and to energy storage and emerging markets, the next frontier. We're here today because the clean energy transition is happening. It's just not happening fast enough. Energy storage solutions are one of the last pieces of the puzzle. If we can get this right, we'll help unlock the climate smarter world that we so urgently need and that future generations so richly deserve. We have an exciting agenda today. In partnership with UK BASE and EBRD, we've convened leaders in finance, government, and business from all corners of the globe to lead and participate in a variety of plenary and breakout sessions throughout the day. By the way, you should have all received an agenda yesterday via email, as we're going to try to be mostly paperless for today's event. And don't forget that this conversation is happening both online and in person. So if you're on Twitter, social media, please use our hashtag energy storage now, or you can follow us on our live stream uh, at our YouTube page. If you have any questions about the agenda or about the event, please don't hesitate to approach me or anyone else with the green badge like this. And now with housekeeping out of the way, we can, we can begin. I'd like to invite to the stage Josue Tanaka. He's the EBRD's Managing Director for Energy Efficiency and Climate Change and Operational Strategy and Planning. Josue, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Let me unfold my little paper. Only one page, so you can be reassured. So, first point is uh, to um, give you a very warm welcome uh, to EBRD. Also, a very warm welcome to our colleagues from the Climate Investment Fund, from the United Kingdom, uh, from uh, also other representatives of other governments, industry, very important, and other multilateral development banks colleague that I see around the room. And uh, with this uh, welcome, I would uh, like to give a particular emphasis this morning uh, to two notions, innovation and transformation. So since it defined its cl uh, first climate strategy in 2006, innovation has been a very key driver of EBRD operations in energy efficiency, in renewable energy, and also in climate adaptation. Innovative products which combine finance and new technologies were developed over time to promote climate mitigation and adaptation across sectors, many supported, by the way, by the climate investment funds. So, for example, this included in what I would call now the very early days, right, about 13 years ago, the rollout of specialized credit lines initially for industrial energy efficiency, but then over time for increasingly complex sectors, including what was considered at the time complex renewable energy credit lines. In renewables, we've also been working on the long road, starting with the formulation of initial sector development plans, of a regulatory framework for renewable energy, and of bankable PPAs, leading to the first wave of projects. At that stage, we start moving from innovation to transformation as the scale of activity grows, often way beyond our original first mover investments in terms of EBRD and the Climate Investment Funds, for example. So now, after years of quote-unquote preliminary work on the policy and regulatory reform, renewable energy finance is a reality in many of our countries of operations, to name a few, Kazakhstan, Ukraine, Jordan, or Egypt. And so, uh, this morning, we're gathered here <clears throat> to address one of the next stages in the transformation of our energy systems. We know that energy storage is a key element of the global energy transition. In some EBRD countries, we're starting to see the limits of renewable energy integration due to technical limitations of the grid and conventional plants. To the extent it is a cost-effective solution, energy storage provides a way to unlock additional renewable energy generation investment in countries which would otherwise be locked in to existing emissions-intensive power infrastructure. So, because of the versatility of storage technologies in providing various energy services, 
energy storage business models are diverse and require, therefore, a supportive regulatory framework to achieve scale. As was the case for the early phases of renewable energy development, we know that it is important to develop coherent energy policies. policies. Energy storage is not a silver bullet, and stable supporting renewable energy policies that send the right signals to long-term investments are required. In this context, EBRD is therefore looking forward to opportunities to finance energy storage systems in its countries of operations with ongoing technical and business discussions. In Jordan, we are supporting the first pilot tender of a battery storage system and working with the government to establish a permanent storage regime for follow-on investments. And so, the EBRD welcomes this focus on energy storage and expresses particular appreciation for the support provided by the United Kingdom to the CIF Global Energy Storage Facility. This is, in our opinion, highly additional, provides multilateral development banks with the firepower to mobilize private sector investment into storage in our countries of operations and unlocks further increases in renewable energy ambition in the countries in which we work. In closing, and in line with our theme, or the opening theme of innovation and transformation, it is relevant to note the track record of the climate investment funds in supporting innovation and cost reductions in clean technologies such as solar and wind in emerging markets. Energy storage provides a new opportunity for the funds to generate impact at scale. And therefore, we look forward to pursue our long, innovative and transformational collaboration with the Climate Investment Fund. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And now I'd like to introduce our next speaker. Mr. Julian Critchlow is the Director General for Energy Transformation and Clean Growth at the UK Department for Business Energy and Industrial Strategy. Mr. Director General, please. Uh, it has to be one of the longest titles ever, uh, for, <laughs> even for a civil servant. I'm very uh, delighted to welcome you all here uh, today for the event on energy storage, which is uh, hosted by uh, BAFE, uh, my department, in partner with, partnership with the Climate Investment Funds and the EBRD. And I wanted to particularly thank the uh, uh, EBRD and uh, Climate Investment Funds for hosting a series of events this week to help us accelerate and build momentum around tackling climate change and the clean energy transition. Bayes is very focused on the challenges of meeting the UK's net zero commitment and also of working with partners uh, internationally to raise our collective ambition on climate ahead of uh, the Conference of Parties 26, COP26, which we look forward to hosting in the UK next year. And there's no doubt that energy storage technologies will actually be central to the global energy transition. Firstly, if global uh, climate and sustainable development goals are to be met, the full potential of renewables must be realized and at a substantially increased pace. Secondly, as the share of renewables, as you know, moves, uh, increases in the global energy mix, it will have a significant impact on the energy systems overall and how they operate, creating a new set of challenges which must be addressed urgently at the same time. Thirdly, uh, storage technologies will be a core part of the solution. In fact, if you look at forecasts, it suggests that Deployment of batteries in developing countries needs to increase by up to at least 100-fold by 2040 if we are to meet our goals. So in the light of uh, that context, at the recent UN Climate Action Summit in New York, uh, alongside the announcement that the UK would be doubling our in, uh, international climate finance to 11.6 billion over the next five years, Bayes announced that 200 million contribution to launch the climate investment funds uh, new global energy storage program. This new initiative will leverage the strong track record of the climate investment funds in supporting clean technologies to demonstrate and accelerate the deployment of energy storage technologies in developing countries. The new en uh, global energy storage program has the potential to make a significant impact working with our partners in developing and emerging economies. It aims to help deploy approximately 17.5 gigawatt hours 
of energy storage capacity in developing countries by 2025, to support the integration of at least an additional 16 gigawatts of clean energy, to expand energy access for, to a further 6.5 million people, to accelerate the technology cost reductions in storage to, to the benefit of all of us, and to catalyze up to eight pounds in part of finance for every pound contributed. So we look forward to uh, working with the climate investment funds and many of you in the room today on making this a reality and a part of the wider energy storage partnership convened by the World Bank to help share learning and capacity in this sector to drive faster progress. So I want to end by emphasizing uh, how excited we are in the UK to be the first funder of the new global energy storage program and to welcome others to join us in this endeavor. This technology, we believe, is a critical step in the next stage of the clean energy transition and an important part of driving us all to net zero, both in the UK and around the world. Thanks very much. Now please join me in welcoming Mafalda Duarte, head of the Climate Investment Funds. Thank you very much, uh, Scott, and uh, thank you. Uh, I'm addressing uh, Josue and Julian in a minute, but uh, let me first uh, welcome you all. I can't see very well because I have all of these lights in front of me, but um, welcome to this event. Uh, we do hope that this energy storage event uh, will be the best, if not one of the best events on this topic that you have been. I know some of you have been to quite a number of these events over the past uh, years, so I do hope that this certainly meets your uh, expectations. Um, Josue, uh, thank you very much to you and to EBRD um, for being such a great partner, implementing partner of the Climate Investment Funds over the past 11 years and for organizing this event uh, here with us today and for hosting us in a series of events that we are having this week, um, yesterday and, and today and tomorrow. And um, very warm thank you uh, to uh, UK um, Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy <laughs> base. We normally um, just use the acronym. Uh, thank you very much for being such a champion of the Climate Investment Fund since the inception uh, in 2008 um, and um, being a great, great champion of our work over all of these years, uh, along with others in the room and also for uh, convening, uh, co-organizing this important event with us here today. The Climate Investment Funds, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with, with us, uh, we are a set of uh, multilateral climate funds uh, established in 2008 um, to uh, in working in partnership with the multilateral development banks, institutions that have a track record uh, in supporting developing countries in their development ambitions, um, to basically work with them and support them in spearheading uh, climate investments uh, in developing countries. Um, we, um, we have started in 2008, uh, we have grown, uh, we started with around 40, 42 countries. Uh, we now work in 72 developing countries, developing countries globally, um, and our capital has also grown from around five billion to now around 8.5 billion dollars. This is risk pa patient uh, below market rates capital uh, to basically enable and provide the incentives both to governments and to private sector um, entities in developing countries, um, provide them with this capital and the relevant partnerships to really scale up um, investments in clean energy, but also sustainable forest management, climate resilience, um, uh, and sustainable transport. Uh, we are not new to the, to the energy sector. Most of what we have been doing over the past 11 years is in the energy sector. We have around $6.5 billion of our capital um, dedicated to energy transition and energy access uh, projects. Uh, we have also already invested in the number of countries in storage solutions as part of our energy investments. 
but as you have heard and as you well know, because you are experts in this area, if we are to meet our climate goals and if we are to meet um, the energy access goals, universal energy access goals, energy storage solutions need to be scaled up significantly in the short term. And therefore, um, we worked with uh, our partners, uh, the multilateral development banks and um, our recipient countries and our donors uh, to develop this dedicated global energy storage program, uh, which we launched, um, which we didn't necessarily launch. There was a decision to establish this program in June um, and then the UK announced its contribution at the time of the UN Climate Summit in September. And actually, I'm very pleased to be here in London, in the UK, to mark the launch of the program. Um, so we do hope that with this dedicated program, dedicated concerted efforts and resources under this program, we can contribute to making a big difference like we have uh, in energy markets in a number of developing countries globally over the past um, 11 years. Um, so I hope that this event um, will enable all of us to learn um, what are the latest technologies, what are the latest, what's the latest thinking in terms of business models, what is the latest thinking in terms of financial constraints and other hurdles, um, also meet new people and forge relevant partnerships so that we really can uh, very quickly start implementing this, this program and achieving very tangible results. So thank you all very much. I look forward to today and to coming back later in the day and providing some concluding remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Mufalda. And something I neglected to mention earlier is we have tons of swag and merch on that, on that table over there. Feel free to help yourself. It's like a rock concert for energy storage that we're going for. Um, so now I'm, I'd like to introduce our esteemed keynote speaker, Amy Grace. She's the head of clean tech research at Bloomberg New Energy Finance. Amy, the floor is yours. Oh, <laughs> all right. <laughs> So, about 10 years ago, I started in the clean energy sector. My first job at Bloomberg NEF was a lowly wind analyst. And my father called and he said, congratulated me on getting a job in alternative energy. And it really was actually at that point alternative energy. There was about 132 gigawatts of wind and solar installed globally, which in, in the, the grand context of the global power system, it's a drop in the bucket. It's tiny, it's a sideshow. And there was two issues facing the industry at that point. There was this question of cost, where there was renewable energy, where there was wind and solar, it was heavily subsidized. It was basically government programs to install it. And the second issue was whether or not the investment could really, could really be there to back it, to, to scale it. Whether or not investors would come in scale to back what is, at that point, rather risky new technology. And so what happened? Well, the cost came down dramatically, as we all know, particularly for wind and solar. And the investment scaled up to the point where we now have about a third of a trillion dollars invested every year in clean energy. And the rest, as they say, if you go back to my 10 years ago, is history. So now we have over a trillion, dollar, a trillion watts of solar and wind installed globally. And it really is sort of, it's, it's no longer alternative energy. This is, this is, it's here, it's happening, it's here to stay. In fact, last year, or this actually this year, 2019, we're still in 2019, this year, for two-thirds of the world's population, wind or solar is the cheapest form of power unsubsidized. That is, tomorrow, if you wanted to build a new plant to provide a megawatt hour of energy, 
For two-thirds of the world's population, the cheapest way to do that without any government subsidies is to build either a wind farm or a solar farm. That's cheaper than coal, than gas, than nuclear, than any other form of energy. So that, that, that shows you that we, we've essentially achieved that on a new build basis, we've achieved cost parity. And of course, we're here to talk about flexibility. And if you think about where in the world we've had the most penetration of wind and particularly solar, we're starting to see some volatility in the markets. Some, some of the markets saying, you know, it's really a little bit difficult to work around the intermittency of the wind and solar. It's not technically difficult. System planners will tell you it's not really technically difficult. But the market is just saying, you know, it's hard to sort of ramp down that gas and ramp it up. We start to see this what we call negative pricing in the market. So that's essentially where we are today. That's where we are today. And I want to spend some time and talk about where we're going. I work for a company called Bloomberg NEF, and we produce a report every year called the New Energy Outlook. And some people call it our forecast of 2050. We're, we're not stupid. We know it's not a forecast. We're not, we don't know how much wind is going to be installed in 2042. But what we like to think of it is as a modeling exercise to show the direction of travel. And what we do, it's about probably 70 to 100 analysts who actually contribute to this report. And what we say is, to simplify it, we look at demand. What is demand going to be over uh, out through 2050? And not just demand on sort of a high level, but really demand annually, demand seasonally, demand intraday. So every hour, what does that demand look like? And we look at, it's more complicated than that. We look at demand erosion and evolution of demand in many different markets. But in order to meet that demand, what is the cheapest way we could meet that demand out to 2050? Considering all the seasonal challenges and the intraday challenges, what's the cheapest way we can meet that demand? And we, and we look at everything we know. We've, we spend a lot of time tracking costs and how costs have declined. And it's very difficult for a new technology, a new radical storage technology, to say, I know that's going to be this price in 2040. But for lithium-ion batteries or for wind and solar, we have a, actually a decades-long track record of tracking those costs. We can rather you know, pr pretty reliably predict where those costs are going and where those costs will be. So we say, okay, that's, 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 that's the modeling exercise. What's the cheapest way to meet that demand? And when we do that, we wind up with something like this. We wind up with about 50% of power globally coming from wind and solar. So we say 50 by 50. It's not quite, it's 48 by 50, but it's better marketing to say 50 by 50. And about two-thirds of that power being renewable, so wind, solar, hydro. About one third of it is fossil fuel. So that's actually a complete inverse of where we are today. So right now we're about two thirds fossil fuels, one third renewable energy, most of that hydro. And we're going, we're, we're flipping that. We're doing two thirds renewables, one third fossil fuel. And in order to do that, we have to build a lot of capacity. Because, of course, grant demand is growing, but that's not the only reason we have to build a lot of capacity. We have to build it because it takes a lot more wind and solar capacity to meet demand, not just when the wind and solar is blowing, but when it's actually not blowing. And then what we find is it's actually cheaper to overbuild that wind and solar and curtail it than it is to build an, an alternative form of energy. So we're, about, we're going to more than double the amount of total capacity in the system. So it goes from about 7 terawatts to about 19 terawatts by 2050. And a lot of that, most of it actually, is going to the Asian market, particularly China and India, where you see growing demand for, for new generation. So it's really a global phenomenon. Yes, Europe, yes, the US, yes, Latin America, yes, the rest of the world, but very heavily Asia. So I want to spend some time and talk about flexibility, because presumably it's the sort of topic of this, of this conference. And when you add a lot of wind and solar to a system, it's intermittent. You, you need a system that's flexible. You need a system that can sort of dance around that intermittency. And so we, because we're looking at not just overall demand, but intraday demand and seasonal demand, we have to understand how, that flex, how does that system work? How do you create a system that's low cost that can provide that flexibility? So, the one way I'm going to look at that right now is just by looking at the Spain and Portuguese market, the Iberian market. And this is a graph that shows essentially the demand is that gray dotted or a black dotted line. And this is a spring day this coming spring. And essentially it looks like it did 
you know, it looks like many markets, California a couple years ago, you have that red base load of nuclear that doesn't really do much, <coughs> just goes on. You have the gray that is providing a, a, a large chunk of the power, that's the gas, and it's starting, you can see, to already sort of maneuver around the, the wind and the solar, and solar onslaught in the middle of the day. And that pink that's discharging, you can probably barely see it, that's your battery discharging. It's just starting little bit there and then you can see where it's charging from that excess solar on the top and you might not even be able to see it so minimal. In five and a half years from now, you're starting to see that gas, that nuclear is still on, actually you're starting to require some flexibility from that nuclear, just a little bit because nuclear is not that flexible, but that gas, that gray is really now dancing around the onslaught of solar and wind. So ramping down very hard in the morning hours when the sun starts to rise and ramping up very heavily in the evening hours. And that pink, the demand from the batteries is starting to grow a bit. And what's interesting is, as what I mentioned before, is that purple on the top, that's curtailment, actually. Because what's interesting about what we model to model this least cost system is that it's cheaper, as I said, to actually build excess solar that you can't use and curtail it than it is to actually build gas or something that you could use all the time. And so you're starting to have that curtailment. You're starting to see the batteries. And then if you fast forward to 2050, it becomes even more extreme. That gas is almost entirely gone. You can, you're essentially filling in most of those gaps with a much larger amount of, 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 battery dis, dispatch, of dispatchable batteries. But you're effectively filling in that with wind and a lot of curtailed solar, just solar that is just getting wasted. And granted, you know, we all wonder what is the solar really going to be wasted? Are you going to find new uses for free power? Probably you're going to find new uses for it. But but this huge amount of curtailed solar and that battery starting really contributing to providing that flexibility. So why is that? So as I said, it's it's what we do is sort of look at least cost. And as we know, battery costs have come down a lot. They've come down about 85 percent from 2010 to 2018. And where we are with batteries is sort of interesting because I've been in the industry for 10 years and I've watched what's happened with solar and you know the decline of solar costs and the buildup of manufacturing capacity in China and other places that have con contributed to the depression of solar prices even further. And we're sort of just starting that story with, with storage. So if you look at manufacturing capacity, it's gonna more than triple by 2025. The next five years, it's gonna more than triple. We're gonna have three times more manufacturing capacity for lithium ion batteries than we do today. And why is that? It's not because of the storage industry. It's not because of the energy storage industry. It's because of EVs. So the storage industry will actually benefit simply because of the growth in EV demand. Because we're gonna build all this manufacturing capacity to meet EV demand, and as a byproduct of that, we'll have cheaper storage. And so how cheap is battery storage going to get? We measure that in two ways, much like we do actually for wind and solar, which I didn't get into, but we measure it in two ways. We measure new versus new. That is, if you had to build a new plant tomorrow, which plant would you build? And because yeah. new versus new isn't o is only relevant when you need new power, you need more power, which is most of the developing markets, most of the places where your, your, your demand for generation is growing. In developed markets, like the US, like Europe, you actually don't need new generation. So a new versus new comparison is totally irrelevant. It's new versus existing. So we do that in, as part of our exercise for looking at wind and solar development. We do it also for batteries. So here on the left, you can see sort of the range of battery storage. <clears throat> the big question is what kind of storage does battery provide? Is it one hour storage? Is it providing sort of short term flexibility? Because that's a lot cheaper than providing longer duration, like four hour battery storage, where you can really start to compete with gas, that providing longer duration storage. And if you can see, this is all unsubsidized. This year in the US, a one hour battery is about equivalent to building a new CCGT plant, getting that storage from a new CCGT plant or OCGT plant. It's pretty equivalent. Four hour bar battery, you're nowhere near. In 2030, so about 10 years from now, it will be much cheaper to get that one hour battery storage, one hour storage from a battery, and about equivalent, give or take, to get the four hour storage. So that's the point at which it makes more sense or makes as much sense 
for that longer duration storage to build a battery than it does OCGT or CCGT in a new versus new situation. New versus existing, we're a little bit further away. So here, if you, if you had to build today, on the left-hand side, if you needed one hour of storage, it's actually cheaper just to run any existing plant in the US. Granted, gas prices are really cheap, so I've picked a difficult market, but it's much cheaper to, to run an existing OCG or CCGT plant than it is to build a new battery. And at four hours, you're way out of the money. And by 2030, you're not quite there yet. It's interesting, and I actually realized I didn't have the 2040 picture, but by 2040, that changes. By 2040, your, your, your four-hour sto storage on a new versus existing plant is actually in the money. And so when we see and we look, and granted, this is different for every market in the world when we do this analysis, but by 2040 to 2050, that's the period in which it's actually cheaper to build a new battery than it is to run existing CGGT or OCGT. And that's the point at which the batteries really start to take off because you know, why wouldn't you do that, right? So when we go back to our battery forecast, I want to have three things on this slide. This is my last slide. So this is our forecast for batteries or for storage, but effectively because we know the cost of lithium ion, it's essentially a lithium ion battery forecast. Right now we're at the far left hand side of that chart. We're back where we were for wind and solar when it was still alternative energy. So we're really early days here. One thing I want to point out is that's definitely going to change because these costs are definitely going to come down and that's going to scale up pretty rapidly. And the third point I want to make is that this is really a global phenomenon. So all those different regions in there, it's all different countries all over the world. Granted, yes, China and the US are the biggest markets, but it, this is really the beginning of a global phenomenon. So every market in the world is going to be affected. With that, I will close. Thank you very much.